All right, how about that video? Let's give a round of applause to UMBC. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of several Retriever Grateful Tours here in Annapolis. Tonight is all about celebrating the three decades of transformational leadership of Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Let's give Dr. Rabowski a round of applause. My name is Brian Frazee, and I uh, have the honor of serving as president of the UMBC Alumni Association Board of Directors, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to those of you who are joining us virtually as well. I also am proud to serve as vice president of government affairs for the Maryland Hospital Association, and I'm very happy to be here tonight to kick off this very special event, and I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank all of the um, staff that made this event possible. Um, and I want to share a personal story about Dr. Rabowski before I turn the podium over and get the program started. We have a lot of great content for you tonight, but I want to take a moment to, uh, of, personal, uh, of personal privilege to, sh to share my story and my connection to Dr. Rabowski. When I was a senior in high school, um, I had the pleasure of serving as student member of the State Board of Education. And through that experience, I had an opportunity to do an informational interview uh, with my home state senator at the time, who happened to be the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Mac Middleton. I think a lot of you all know who, who he is. Um, and when I met with Senator Middleton, he said, you're thinking about going to UMBC. Hold on a second. Let me call Dr. Rabowski. And he called Dr. Rabowski, and Dr. Rabowski happened to be available, and he talked to me about why I should come to UMBC. And here we are. And boy, did I make the right decision. So thank you, Dr. Rabowski. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Greg Simmons, our Vice President of Institutional Advancement, to get our program started. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, so many people have been supporting the university. Uh, in so many ways for so long, I'm a little out of practice, to be honest. We're used to like looking at a screen for the last three years, so if I'm nervous, just give me a little bit of extra extra time, okay? So part of what we're supposed to do is tell our Freeman Rabowski stories. Uh, there's a lot of inspirational stories that, that Freeman has. I, I'll tell you the story about the second time I ever, I ever drove Freeman anywhere. Freeman and I have driven together many times. I won't tell you the first time when I got pulled over for speeding and he got me off a speeding ticket. <laughs> But the second time, we drove here. We drove to Annapolis, and he did a speech. Um, and we were driving home. The very next morning, we got a call from the chief archivist of the state archives. He said, uh, we talked to Karen Winch at the time, Freeman's assistant. He said, we have a number of Dr. Rabowski's papers. We come to find out that someone, and it's gone unsaid who, because it could have been either one of us, left Freeman's folder on the roof of the car as we drove out of Annapolis. So it speaks both to the grace and dignity of Dr. Rabowski that he never accused me of doing it, but he also didn't take credit for doing it if it was him. So we'll let that go one way or the other. But, uh, you know, so, so Freeman, um, Freeman has been an extraordinary leader for so many years. We're, we're so proud of the opportunity to kind of bring him around and let people hear some of the stories and share some of the experiences that they have. We look forward to them tonight. It's also my honor and responsibility to welcome a, a number of special guests here today. Um, especially want to thank a number of the elected officials who do so much to support UMBC in so many ways. And so first, of course, uh, Speaker Delegate Jones is here. Um, Senator Dolores Kelly just joined us. Give her a round of applause, please. Come on, right? <laughs> Senator Sidner was here earlier. He had to leave. Uh, but we're also joined by uh, Delegate Harry Bandari, <laughs> Delegate Mark Chang. Who's also a big UMBC basketball fan, right? We're playing in the, the first game of the, the America East Championship this week. Uh, Delegate Michelle Guyton and Delegate Kathy Forbes. Thanks so much for everything you do to support UMBC. Uh, there's also a number of uh, the members of the UMBC Alumni Association. You heard from Brian, I see Damian, there's some others coming in and out. So other members of the alumni board here, raise your hand. There we go, there's Karen. It's great to see everybody. Thanks for the leadership that you provide. See our, a former president, Bill Glover, over there, um, and a number of my colleagues from UMBC. So take the time to connect with them. Um, they can catch you up to speed with everything that's going on. And so many people who have been supportive of the campus in many, many ways through the years. So it's my pleasure now to, to actually introduce um, Speaker Jones. And, and she doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, she has 
played such a powerful role for UMBC um, and for the state in, in so many ways in so many years. Uh, for people who don't know, she graduated from UMBC with a psychology degree. Yeah, uh, she, yeah. she was uh, first elected to the House of Delegates in 1997. Um, the first woman and the first African American to be elected the Speaker of the House. There are so many ways that you could describe her, integrity, courage, strength. I always think of one word, indomitable. Um, and she has been exceptional, and we're so grateful for everything you do to support UMBC. Please. Thank you. What a lot of people don't know is that uh, Freeman and I, our ages are not that different. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I graduated from <laughs> UMBC in 1976. Freeman, degree in psychology, comes in handy. I can tell you it does. Freeman came to UMBC in 1992? 87. 87, that's right, the first time, yeah. Yes, and so, um, but I've, he was at Coppin. To Senator Kelly, she, yeah, she, she knows that. And we, I think like the first, time, because um, when I was at UMBC, and Diane Hutchins can uh, attest to this, and, uh, uh, she's an alumni, I don't know why she's sitting way over there, but um, there weren't as many students as they are now, and there aren't as many students of color are there. I think there was like eight. And during that time, in, you know, it's between 72 and 76, you know, there were dorm one, dorm two, <laughs> lecture hall one, lecture hall two. But I'm saying all this, and we got to know each other when um, my role in the uh, General Assembly, I think you, uh, we had me on the, um, one of those, one of the boards and we reviewed and, and so, but always been a supporter, always admired, uh, Dr. Rabowski and you know his, his family and and um, I think the other connection was when I was on appropriation and I was the capital budget chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> a chair and that another alum. That's why when um, you know we I was chapter budget for about sixteen years or something like that. So. But um, you know we looked out for, for UMBC. And um, the person who preceded me, Mark Chang, UMBC grad. So, so we had to have another UMBC. So, and then I chaired the Education Economic Development. And so we, our paths had crossed. Uh, we're very supportive of his, of the, Charlie, he's very supportive of me. I was very supportive of him. Um, all the accolades over the years, that, you know, people know him from all over the country. Um, there's no one like Freeman Rabowski, and that's in a positive way, you know, so. And, you know, when he, although he may be leaving the state, and look at it, he's doing his own uh, video. video and <laughs> you didn't get my permission, no. <laughs> but I, I know what's, um, ahead of him, I'm probably going to be several other books um, in, you know, post UNBC. Um, and, you know, it just been, he's been very supportive of me. And he's the type of person that we could call and say, what do, what do you think about this? And he would never say, well, I know I don't have time right now. So, uh, or go talk to, you know, this person. He's the type of person that he's very, very humble and, you know, not all presidents are like that. I'm saying a broad term president are like that. And he is, and he is, you know, I, I know even that he may um, be 
going out of state someplace and I have an idea where it is. And, uh, but I know that we're gonna stay in touch and I know that uh, who this, his successor, which is just the person who comes after him, because um, there's only one of you, um, you know, I, I'm sure that she will be, oh, excuse me, did I say she? <laughs> <laughs> will be in contact with you at all times. And I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I'm glad this is like one of many, and I'm glad to be a part of this. I don't know how many others you have had, but this, but you're saying this is wonderful? He said, well, in other words, he's saying, quit while you're ahead and go sit down. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm gonna do that. So, you can call, come on back up. So, <laughs> Thank you so much, Speaker Jones. Let's, let's give Speaker Jones another round of applause. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for your support of UMBC. So I'm very excited to move us to the next uh, part of the program. I'd like to invite Dr. Rabowski and Dr. Kimberly Moffitt up to the stage. Dr. Kimberly Moffitt is the Interim Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at UMBC. And Dr. Freeman Rabowski, as you all know, is the president of UMBC. And Dr. Moffitt is going to lead a discussion uh, for the next half an hour or so with Dr. Rabowski. Um, and during this time, if you all would like to submit your own questions for the two of them, um, please use the Slido that you did in the beginning. Um, and after their conversation, we will take time for two or three of the audience questions. That goes for you too, for the uh, folks that are virtual um, to be able to do that. So uh, Dr. Moffitt, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Am I, oh, I can hear myself. Okay. <laughs> um, well, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I am in charge of trying to contain Freeman um, in his sharing of wonderful stories and um, moments of his 30-year history with UMBC. So thank you so much for being here to hear, um, but also to greet him and acknowledge him for all that he has done for our institution over that 30-year period. Dr. Rabowski, I want to start by asking a broad question yes. that is about this tour. And we are referring to this tour as the Retreat Ever Grateful Tour. Okay. Um, that is named in large part because of how grateful UMBC alumni yeah. and community are for your leadership you. and how you've led the university to its national recognition. You've given so much to this university. Can you muse just a bit on what retreat ever grateful means to you? I love it. I love it. Hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> we want to be very conversational today. I, I have to start by saying how proud the UMBC community is of Dr. Kimberly Moffat. She has grown up from assistant professor up through the ranks, full professor. She's now our first dean who is African-American of an academic college and only second woman. Would you give Dr. Moffat a round of applause? <laughs> And since Senator Kelly comes out of the humanities and, and we've got our speaker who's from psychology, College of Arts and Humanities, Social Sciences, and a, a scholar in the humanities. Yep. So we're very proud of that to start yep. there. Uh, I would say this. This past 30 years as president, 35 at UMBC, 10 in public higher education before that at Coppin State, 45 years. These have been the best years of my career and my life. My wife and I would say the best years of our existence uh, in the state of Maryland. And most important, the success has come because of so many people represented by the people in this room. For me, it's when you all talk about grateful, uh, it is my being grateful to UMBC, to this state, for what it's done for education, for young people, Starting off when I was 26, Dolores, <laughs> right, 45 years later. And so gratefulness for me, gratitude, has everything to do with a mutual respect that we all have um, for what this state has done, for what public officials, this one in, in particularly in, in Annapolis, what public officials have done for higher education and for UMBC, when we can talk about 
our alums who are in the legislature and others who are not, who believe in education. So this is about gratitude, but it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I could not be more grateful than I am tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about UMBC has changed the most huh. um, since you joined the community? And what has stayed the same sure, for you? Sure. Then sure. talk to us about um, what do you see in terms of opportunity for growth and um, change? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you heard uh, the speaker talking about a small number of students. Uh, the fact is that we started, and remember, in those early years, UMBC really was a was I would call it an experiment. We got people from the founding four here. And they know what I'm talking about. It was an experiment. Can we bring this campus together when you've got other established campuses in the state mm -hmm. um, and see how you can bring people from all kinds of backgrounds? I like telling people that this was the first campus that had people of all races there. The first one. All right. Every other campus, remember the history of the South of America was what blacks or whites. People of all backgrounds could be there, predominantly white, but people of all backgrounds. And I say that to say this. We have shown America what higher education can be, to have people from all types of backgrounds, religions from all over the world. And we are representative of a system, the University System of Maryland, I would say, that is showing what a state can do to build education and to build the citizenry and build the economy. So what has changed? I would say it is that people know now that the UMBC product is first rate. Give our alumni a round of applause. Yep. It's first rate. They're first rate. <clears throat> Those people who were in the first classes were there to experiment, and they went on and did wonderful things. We talk about our founding four, those first four classes. And then we talk about every group, those there in the 70s, from the late 60s, early 70s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up until today. And you see, you saw some of the graduates. So we are known around the country as a university that produces excellent students and excellent research. That's the other big deal. It's a big deal that the faculty have worked so hard with staff and that we're now at the top tier of research universities, R1. Big round of applause for that. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I think has changed. At one point in, in America, we thought at universities, if most people didn't make it, it must be it's a really good place. Think about that. If most people can't get in and most people can't make it, it's a really good place. We've come to know we should be a university that admits students and makes sure they succeed. Mm -hmm. There's the difference. So uh, some of you know I will say, when I was in college, a lot of you, dean or the president would say, look at the students to your left, look at the students to your right, one of you will not graduate. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible thing to say to young people. Yeah. What's changed? We say, look at the student to your left, look to your right, all you all are going to graduate <laughs> because we believe in you. Give us a look. That's what's changed. We believe in our students. If we let you in, you're supposed to make it. That's right. Okay. That's the idea. That's yeah. the, okay. So where are we going? Where are we going? You know, reputation and reality are never quite the same. It takes a while, even after you're doing better and better, for people to know how good you are. I, when I tell you we are good, when I tell you that Greg and I get a chance to teach up at Harvard and we work with presidents around the country, Harvard knows that we are good. When I got that honorary degree from them a few years ago, uh, the president, Drew Faust, said, the oldest, 1636, salutes the youngest, 1966. And she said this, when it comes to the, to the UMBC product that comes to Harvard, two words we use, consistently superb. Now, when Harvard speaks, make no mistake, everybody listens. So the people who were there were saying, can I get my kid in the, to UMBC, all right? <laughs> now, that was years ago. The longer our graduates are out working and leading in legislation, leading in corporate America, and leading to create vaccines, the more the head of the APL at Hopkins, president of Clemson, the more people know that story. And so the future will mean more light shining on us and more people wanting to give us funding. Some of you know when 
back in the 60s and 70s, even when I became president, we didn't have more than a million dollars in our endowment. As of now, we're at about 150 million. Give us a round of applause for that. Where are we going? In the next, in my lifetime, I want to see UMBC's endowment at $500 million. Oh, wow. Round of applause for the idea, <laughs> for the vision, for the vision. Look at Greg over there. Greg is putting his hand down here. <laughs> and th this is what I promise you, wherever I go, I, I will be so proud of this new president and the faculty. I will be working as hard as I can to bring and pull resources to the state and to UMBC. So when I say it, it's not because I'm saying I'm gone, no. Um, UMBC is in my blood, and it, it's a part of our DNA, and we will build. And you heard me say it here. From 150 in the next years, yeah, yeah, half billion dollars. Mark my word. Watch it. Watch it. That's where we're going, okay? okay. And the legislature keep giving us money. Give me a round of applause. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> no shame, no shame. <laughs> so let's shift very quickly to your own personal journey. Mm. Um, and I'd like you to chat about just yeah. a bit, given the uh, injustices that you've had to overcome to reach your level of success, what are a few guiding principles you've used to maintain a positive and productive attitude? Yeah. I appreciate that. Everybody who knows me knows I am a faith. We have all religions on our campus, some people who are not religious, some who are spiritual, but I am a faith. And my faith has always sustained me. And I'm very proud to say that. Um, the other night at the Senate, first thing, one of the first things Senator Kelly said to me was about my mother. Because I knew her mother, who taught at Coppin, and she knew my mother, from, from the English teacher, from coming up here. And my mother's saying was, hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. I put that on a tombstone. And I tell you that because it has been that faith, that religious faith, but faith in us as human beings, faith in this state, faith in UMBC, faith in education that can allow me to say, yeah, I may have had some challenges as a child, but my parents always told me, you judge people by the content of their character. You don't make assumptions based on race, or where they come from, you judge them by the content of their character. And what has helped me so much, and I think all of us, is we, every one of us in this room has a story. I've told Adrian's story so many times, and being the little colored girl in the classroom and the teacher who helped out, all those Mark, Mark told us the story the other night. Uh, in the hearing, he came over and told the story of being that young boy from, from Glen Burnie and not having confidence and what education has done for him and where he is today. Everybody has a story. And I tell you that because it will be our stories that will inspire us to say this is where we are. Most people, when UMBC was founded, most Americans hadn't had anybody to go to college. Literally, only 10% of Americans had somebody who had gone to college in 1966. Today, we're up to 30%. Our state is the best educated, along with one or two other states, Massachusetts, New Jersey. But we are at 40% with college, all right? We've done better, and that's for every race we've done better. You know, we can go to the next level. And what has sustained us has been getting more and more people educated, better jobs, but also learning how to think. This is a state where people think critically about quality of life issues. This legislature funding pre-K through higher education. We are a model for the country. I want us to have the same sense of confidence that my cousins and friends in Texas have. <laughs> I've never met a Texan who didn't love Texas. <laughs> you know, think about it. I've told presidents from that place that, I mean, I've never, and maybe it's the way they teach, teach history, but, and they were their own country, but the Texans love Texas, all right? And I love that. I want Marylanders to, wherever they go, to say, we are from Maryland. Oh, yeah, I love saying that in Massachusetts. I love saying, no, no, we're from Maryland, all right? It's a big deal. And that's, that's what sustains me. It's that hope that we can keep going to the next level. And that's what I was going to mention, because during the pandemic, so for the last two years, you have consistently... Uh, ended most meetings with keep hope alive. And I think that adds to that notion of you keeping the positive yeah, and productive yeah. disposition yeah, 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 yeah. 
and that helps to carry you through it some of what you're so doing. so important. My parents, my minister, my teachers, everybody. During this last two years, if you think about it, we've made it through because we kept believing we could. We'll get through this. You know, I pray for the Ukrainians. We all do. We love their sense of self that they will not give up because they're representing for us democracy, you know, and that's, and I think it can, I looked at the, the president the other night and I saw, uh, with all the differences we may have, people came together to say we must fight for democracy. And that's, that's so important around the world. It's important that people be able to vote, right? And we teach people to vote and, you know, it's still, and it's education that makes the difference, it is. When you get that education, you realize we want the right people in office. We want the right people representing us, right? That our votes matter. Just as Brandeis said, the most important role in society is that of a citizen. What does it mean to be a citizen, right? We teach that in our humanities and social sciences courses. We want the K-12 to have that. And so keep hope alive is what we want to keep. We want to keep saying that. Through the difficult times, keep hope alive. Yeah. Exactly. So... Very quickly, before you became president, you would often refer to um, Dr. Michael Hooker mm. as um, one of your mentors. Yes. And yes. I'm curious, what do you feel like you learned most from him? Yes. And then also talk about um, who else do you consider a mentor? Sure. And what consistent information from them sure. do you impart on your mentees? Sure. I, I appreciate that. You know, and I, I start by saying that uh, we all have people we look up to, people who have inspired us all the way back from my grandmother. My grandmother had a sixth grade education. My parents were educated. Grandmother, who was the daughter of slaves, <clears throat> was a brilliant woman. And she said to me, uh, it's one of the wisest people I ever knew. She said, Freeman, you're going to do well because you work so hard. You're going to do well. She said, I just want you to remember to stay on your knees. And I said, yeah, I know, Grandma. She said, no, I, for two reasons, yeah, but by the grace of God, stay on your knees, keep, keep that humility. She said, but, but, you know, as you go up the ladder, what you're going to find is there will be times when you get knocked down. Mm -hmm. But if you're on your knees, you won't fall too far. I, you I mean, I've thought about that so long, and for some of the elected officials in here, you know what I'm saying, that if we get inflated, when we make mistakes, it's hard. Because we all make mistakes. But if you keep that humility, mm -hmm. people will work with you. And they will give you. And so for me, the mentors, from starting with her to my parents to my minister, but also I would say along the way, people like Walter Sondheim and Bob Meyerhoff have been wonderful mentors to me. But people I didn't even meet. Mary McLeod Bethune, the wonderful woman educator over a school for little girls of color in Florida. I always followed her. I always followed I've read everything that she did and what she did with, with that wonderful woman, Eleanor Roosevelt, another mentor. That you, <laughs> sometimes your mentors are not even people you've met. You get my point. But you, you look at what they do with their lives, and it makes such a difference. And so all those people, and so many more, have been mentors. But my students inspire me. Let me just say that. My students inspire me in ways you would know. At any given point at UMBC, several students will have cancer. The whole time I've been there, there have always been students there with cancer, or their mamas have cancer, or somebody else, but they, they've had cancer at 19 and 20, and I've always sought those students out to be supportive, but because they lift me up. And I've seen how their faith and their, their willingness to do everything necessary has led to our making it through, and when they didn't make it through, They have said, it's okay, Doc. I can, think of, I can think of people who said, life is beautiful. He wrote, wrote a song, and he died at 20. Mm -hmm. But that inspired me, that even when it was that bad, he took the time to appreciate the living he did. You get my point? And, that, and that, what could be more inspiring than that? Education is... And a phenomenal place to learn how to live and how to die. That's as fundamental to life as it gets. Do you think that's what you then impart to your mentees? Oh, I hope so. To the joie de vivre. Everybody knows I'm studying French. Je parle français avec mes étudiants tous les jours. 
I started several years ago, and they said, Greg is rolling his eyes right now. And they, <laughs> they roll their eyes when I speak French. <laughs> but they said, don't you think you're kind of old, Doc? I said, bring it on. So je parle, je te le français chaque jour. I study French every day. The joy of living, of learning, right. of loving. This is what I want students and alumni and all of us to do, mm -hmm. to keep learning all the time, to keep loving all the time, and to appreciate every moment, every day of living. I, I am leaving physically UMBC, but I'm going to always be a part of UMBC, and they will be in me. But when I go, wherever I go, I will talk about UMBC stories. You know, I, because there's so many wonderful stories. Every one of you has a story. Yeah. yeah. And, and as one of your mentees, I agree with you in terms of the modeling that you have done yes. for many of us Thank that you. it's not even always the words that you say, but oftentimes it is what you're modeling for Thank us. You, you know, you. that you are taking Tai Chi, that you're learning <laughs> French, yeah. that you see yourself as an eternal student. That's right. That That's there's right. so much to learn yes. that you're going to continue to do it yes. as long as you're able Every to. Every day. Yeah. Every day. That's and I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that message. I, I have often heard myself um, say to my husband when he says, when are you going to be comfortable and settled? And I said, that is called death. <laughs> so I don't want to get to that point because there's too much for us to experience That's exactly and right. learn That's in this life's journey. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. So in terms of your legacy, I am curious because we have four distinct uh, scholars programs. Mm -hmm. um, the Meyer Hoff, of course, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the entire country knows about mm -hmm. and probably even outside of this country. Mm -hmm. uh, the Seinheim Scholars Program, Linehan Scholars, mm -hmm. and clearly the Sherman yes. Scholars Program. Yes. And now the Rabowski Fund for <laughs> Student Excellence. <Right. laughs> So can you talk about the significance of these donors um, sure. who have scholarships named after them and what they have meant to the success sure. of UMBC? You know, I was at dinner last night with Bob Meyerhoff, who will be 99 oh, wow. his oh, next wow. birthday. 99, and he is as intellectually keen and as full of humor as ever mm -hmm. and wanting to know about students and how they're doing. We were having dinner with him and Rita Becker and Jackie and I were, and with, and with Betsy Sherman, whose husband died in the last year, my dear friend, uh, because of an accident, George. Uh, but Betsy, Betsy was a teacher in Northern Virginia, literally 50 years, more than 50 years ago. And she was the only white teacher in the minority school. And she had not really been, she's from Boston. And she says, Ka. You know, I, I always tease about that accent. And, and um, she learned so much about human behavior. And what she said to George and to me and to others was, I learned that a teacher of any race could teach a child of any race, that it was the love that made the difference. And I want young people to think about working with, in challenging schools and helping children of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And George, who was an engineer, and she together connected this idea of the Sherman Scholars to be first-rate teachers, people with majors in math and science who are going to work in middle schools at Lakeland and other places in the city. And then they wanted to add to it pre-K because of all the challenges of early childhood. So you got these Sherman scholars who are excellent teachers working from kindergarten through middle school. And it was just recently that she said, I want to do more. I want to help more. I want to produce more of these teachers and have more work focused on early childhood, but also on helping children in the reading and math in Baltimore City. And so it is, they'd already given us about 15 million, and they've just given us another 21 million. Give them a round of applause, would you? <laughs> so these scholars programs from Bob Meyerhoff to Sherman's to the Lenny Hands, whom I met really in Israel as they talked about the Baltimore School for the Arts, and I started talking about arts in UMBC, <laughs> and who've given us a lot of money for the Lenny Hand Artist Scholars, and then the Humanity Scholars, Humanity Scholars that we have, and then the program for the Center for Women in IT, Seawood Scholars, because there are too, many, too few women majoring in computer science right now. These are all programs that focus on building community teaching people to believe in paying it forward, and most important, in believing in themselves. If there's one thing we should all be doing for our young, 
It is to help every child to believe in herself and to understand how exciting it is to keep growing and learning and studying and dreaming about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. This is what the scholars programs do, but let me just say, what the scholars programs have done is to show us how we should be doing things for all of our students in building mm -hmm. community, you see. So it's not just the elite there. When you look at UMBC, you will see communities of people of all types in all kinds of disciplines. The Sondheim scholars, by far in many ways, the one that will have the greatest impact on policy in the country because of our beloved Walter Sondheim, whose statue is on campus. Um, and I'm always talking about Alicia Wilson as an example of what we can do, taking a child from Mervo, the, the vocational school in the city, bringing her as valedictorian to UMBC, becoming a wonderful Sondheim scholar, moving on to become law student, doing well there, coming first black, becoming first black partner in a major law firm young black woman up for there, amazingly and fine black. Give her a round of applause for Alicia. <laughs> and now seeing her as vice president for economic development at Hopkins mm -hmm. from Mervo, okay? Wonderful vocational school in the inner city where, they, where so many kids think the most they can do is to become a cosmetologist. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm saying when that's right, to having somebody with not just a law degree, but one of the senior members of the, of the, of the staff at Hopkins. That's what education, and the Sondheim Scholars, that's what they can do. Big deal. And the nicest story of all, I've been on the France Merrick Board <clears throat> for years and years, and that's one of the fine families of, of Maryland. Um, and I'm coming off, and they've selected the person to, to replace me, and it is a Sondheim Scholar, Alicia Wilson. Give her another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> So again, we know that the Meyerhoff program is is nationally recognized. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, attempting to be duplicated. Yes. <laughs> but the original stands with us. <laughs> yes. Um, but what do you see as being um, the future of UMBC in terms of wh what will we be known for? Yeah, what yeah. are you hoping we are I known for? I appreciate that. It is uh, for the, being the model of inclusive excellence, meaning students of all races you start there, of all races who do superbly, who can be a first generation little white kid from Baltimore County, Jim Clements, and go and be president of Clemson. It's no, it doesn't get any better than that. He sends for me on the plane. Clemson has a plane, folks, <laughs> good football. And I tell them, UMBC gives me, you know I have a plane too, <laughs> Southwest. <laughs> the exit row, the exit row. <laughs> but no, I mean, you just think about these young people. I mean, the message of UMBC really is you don't have to be rich to be the best. You don't have to be rich to be the best. I was on the phone with the president of Harvard, and he's bragging on our UMBC graduate, Kismikia, out of rural North Carolina through UMBC, now the faculty at Harvard. This is the point that, and we will be known as the place that produces these superbly prepared students of all backgrounds, all races, from all around the world, from all around the world, every group. And then when you come to that campus, you see, when, and now that we're coming out of COVID and they're walking around, it feels like the Plaza of Nations at the UN, but it is what we want America to be. People from all over the world, people from all kinds of backgrounds, some whose parents went to college, some whose parents didn't, of every race, different religions, but who are working with each other. There's the point I want to make. That it's great to be, to know one's own, but it's even better when you know others. Mm -hmm. Very important point, when you know others. The legislature can't make it if they just work with each other within one group, one part of the state. They got to work to get, right? And that's what we do at UMBC. We'll be known for that. People are coming. Howard Hughes Foundation is just investing $2 billion to produce more representative faculty members from all groups since so few, for example, of the 1,000 Howard Hughes investigators means you get salaries, literally everything paid, facilities, millions of dollars, could be for the rest of your life if you keep doing well. <clears throat> um, under 1% are black right now, and similarly Latino. One of the first 
and one of the few, I should say, HHMIs is a Meyerhoff Conference of Rasa. Just became a member of the National Academy of Sciences and HHMI investigated at Duke University. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> but the point is that that money, they are, they are replicating, using part of those $2 billion to replicate Meyerhoff. So we are being replicated at Chapel Hill, at Penn State, out at San Diego, at UK Berkeley. And when I'm going around, I'll be talking about what this state has done and what UMBC does. So people will be coming more and more to see how are they doing what they're doing. That's the best news we can get. Yeah. Let's talk very briefly about our research one, R1 stats. Yes. Um, I think I was a part of the distribution from the President's Council that saw that email. Not, it came in at 3.17 in the morning. I did not see it then, <laughs> but it was sent it was by sent. Dr. Rabowski at 3.17 <laughs> in the morning. So I have a sense of what you would say in response to this question, yeah. but I'm curious, yeah. what were you feeling when you received the news? <laughs> and what has it changed um, for you since then? So for those of you who are of a certain vintage, who are over 50, 55, sometimes you get up in the middle of the night. You do. <laughs> 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 Speaking presidentially. <laughs> so I'm up, and uh, as I'm about to get back into bed, I'm just looking to make sure there's no emergency on my phone. And there's this message from Connick saying, you know, research one. And I, I was so not believing it, I went and washed my face. <laughs> and I looked at it again to make sure I was reading correctly, and it said what I thought we'd see in three or four years. I was looking forward to people telling me three or four years you'd become research one. Because we had been there, by the way, in the sciences, we needed to build humanities and social sciences, and we've been working on that, investing in it. And the state helped us so much, Adrian, everybody else in this room, all of you with the facilities that new arts and humanities, that helped us to attract more faculty, more research, and it's just really been well. The big grant that the dean here just got from Moffitt for $3 million, good deal, big deal. All of that helped. So here's the point. I was so excited. I wrote an email to the president's council. At three, I forgot it was 317. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said to me the next morning, are you crazy? Why are you up at 317? I, and I was kind of humble. I just said, I just happened to be up. Right? <laughs> if you're of a certain vintage, you understand that. Right? <laughs> but it was such a surprise. It was, And the man who, things work for a reason. The guy who heads the whole effort, just by chance, had been a member of the accreditation team to UMBC. And um, so he put in the letter, um, he said, I know what this means. He said, consider it a gift to you hmm. before you leave. But he said, he said, but well deserved. It was really nice. And then when I called him the next morning and he was so nice, he said, the one thing I didn't say in the letter was, when I came for the accreditation visit, the only thought I had was, if I was younger, I would love to work at UMBC. He's, a, he's at Indiana U. He said, it's such a fabulous place. But, I mean, when people get to know us well, they, when alums come back, when legislators come, they go, wow, this is a magical place. It's a word I would use. It is a magical. You feel it in the air. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think that explains why so many of us are still here. Yes, staying here. That we've decided to stay. And give Dr. Marvin a hand for staying here. We're determined to keep her. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> We're determined to keep her here. I sometimes say we may not have as much money, but we got a lot of love. A lot of love. <laughs> love goes a long way. <laughs> so talk to us very briefly, because I know we're coming to um, an end with our time together, but talk to me um, what, you will, what you think you'll miss most oh. of no longer being president yes. of the university for yes. 30 years. I mean, I wonder if you know what you're going to do with yourself. Oh, I know. I've got, I've got some wonderful opportunities. <laughs> and I've talked to Adrian about some of them, and I'll be announcing some things. Uh, um, I'm not going to be working full time for anybody, but I will be doing more at Harvard and working with national agencies to move the envelope to get more. I mean, the big deal of getting more faculty of all types uh, of all races into the universities and more scientists and others. And I've got people who want to work with me on that, from NIH and NSF to uh, American Council on Education to Aspen. So I'll be, I'll be in that space and working with universities. What I will miss most is, number one, just walking around campus. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and speaking French avec mes étudiants. <laughs> <laughs> He's working his eyes again. Yeah. But no, but you just see, see the students are. Or when you go to a game, one of the reasons my voice is like this is I was announcing. Everybody knows me. I'm such a nerd. But I was so excited to be announcing the basketball game as we were winning, and I was screaming, right? <laughs> so you hear my voice. But it is the community that you feel as a part of that environment with faculty and students and staff. And of course, I will miss that. The good news is so many people will know my email will be the same. My cell will be the same. And I, while I won't be on campus, <clears throat> out of respect for the next president, I am of UMBC. And I will keep that. I will always be. It will be in my heart, always. OK? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Mm -hmm. What's on your bucket list? Well, you know what? I, I'm one of the few people who can honestly say anything I've really wanted to do, I've been fortunate to do it. I have been blessed to be married 51 years. Give my wife a round of applause. I got a wonderful son and grandson who keep my grandson keeps me humble. I love that. <laughs> At 10. But no, no, I mean, I'm one of the few people who can honestly say, there's nothing I'm looking for because I've never had a chance to do it. I've traveled. Um, I, we've, we're blessed with enough money. I can help give out money sometimes. Um, there's nothing. I, all I need to do, all I want to do is just to be a better human being. I really mean that. Just to keep growing and developing. Be a better human being and to keep helping people. That's it. But I have been, UMBC has allowed me, the state, to do anything I really wanted to do. And that's my advice to all of you. Don't put off. Uh-uh. Don't say when I retire. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because you never know if you're going to get a chance to retire. That's life, right? That's right. If you want to do it, you need to do it now because this is not a dress rehearsal. And you can, when I leave, you can say, he felt so good about his life. I have been loved. I have loved deeply. And I love some UMBC. So I, <laughs> that, the bucket list is finished. I'm just, this is about extra stuff. You know, just put the, the cake is baked. Mm. This is about the icing on the cake. You know, uh, that's I'm I'm just I am a blessed man. That is the truth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Moffat, Dr. Rabowski. Thank you so much. Let's give them another round of applause. What an inspirational conversation uh, that we all just witnessed. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, so we have come to the end of the program. We have a closing video for you all, and then Greg Simmons will be uh, providing some closing remarks. So, um, so thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. I also want to uh, welcome Delegate Jessica Feldmark and Delegate Jen Teresa, who joined us today. So give them a round of applause. And I also want to acknowledge how lucky we are that we got an email at 317, because it wouldn't have been surprising to have Freeman call at 317 a.m. from time to time. And so, uh, you know, it's, it is, um, it's hard to think about and reflect on 30 years, right, three decades, and what it's meant. I think this why, that's why this idea of retriever grateful means so much, because it means so many things on so many levels. It means we know that life is challenging, right? These last couple years have been hard. We all face difficulties and challenges in the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're so lucky. We're lucky because we're part of a community that believes in each other and cares about each other, 
And as Freeman talks, the thing that, that I've learned most about Freeman is, is it is the stories that matter. And he's told the stories tonight. And I can look across this room and I see, I see the stories. I, I see how Speaker Jones has helped us in so many ways for so many years. I, I see Mark Chang reaching out and connecting his high school to the Sondheim programs to try and make sure students have an opportunity. I see Chris Valentino, who's worked with us for years to connect to Dr. Anupam Joshi and Dr. Karuna Joshi to make sure that we have a community of cyber scholars and cyber researchers that are addressing the needs of our state and our nation. I think of Karen Woodard, who was an extraordinary student who is also an athlete and now coming back and trying to help elevate our students and our athletes and helping them understand how great they can be. And, and Sandy Geese, who, when I took this job, was one of the first people who reached out to me to help me understand what the University of Maryland Alumni International Group was and helped us think about how do you build this infrastructure that's going to make our alums support each other and support UMBC. So it's all about the stories that we have as a community. Um, Freeman has helped us remember that stories matter, and he's helped us remember that it's important to be grateful. So, Speaker Jones, thank you. Mm -hmm. Freeman and Kimberly, thank you. thank you. Thanks to everybody here who's been a part of the UMBC community, who will continue to be a part of the commu UMBC community, and who knows that we can just be so much better together when we're working to solve our problems and lift everybody up. Have a great night. Enjoy a drink and a snack. We couldn't Give be more Greg appreciative Shepard's of you. Give Greg Shepard and all his staff a round of applause. All the, all the OIA staff. They were wonderful. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, everyone. All. Have a great night. Thank you all. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> do this with repeat after me. We're going to do it twice, and I'm going to give you a test on it. Repeat after me. Thoughts, Thoughts words, words, actions, actions habits, habits, character, character destiny. destiny. One more time. Thoughts, Thoughts words, words, actions, actions habits, habits, character, destiny. destiny. Okay, here we go. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become you see, you kind of know that you don't. Good. <laughs> Be mindful. Be mindful. Let's practice one more time, then you have your test. Thoughts, Thoughts words, words, actions, actions habits. habits Character, destiny. Here we go. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your actions. Watch your habits, they become your character. Your character becomes your destiny. round of applause for UMBC. Thank you, Madeline. You're excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent.